Go ahead. And Dr. Abwazan, you can, uh, I think we have enough people now, so you can feel free to start whenever you're ready. Thank you, Dr. Shen. Uh, do you hear me well? Yes. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for joining. And um, I'm Dr. Abu Azam, a nephrology fellow from Loma Linda University Health. And this presentation was supervised by Dr. Matthew. Um, so today we will review the fluid trial that has been recently published in the American Journal of Kidney Disease. And I would uh, also uh, uh, want to take the chance to thank Dr. Uh, Scott Brimble for joining us, uh, for joining today. So it's the impact of bioelectrical impedance guided fluid management and vitamin D supplementation on left ventricular mass in patients receiving uh, peritoneal dialysis. Uh, so cardiovascular disease is highly uh, prevalent in dialysis patients. Around 40% of dialysis uh, of death in dialysis patients is related to cardiovascular disease, mainly uh, the arrhythmias and sudden cardiac death. Uh, multiple studies have been uh, conducted to assess the uh, factors that's leading to sudden cardiac death in dialysis patient, and they found that congestive heart failure and left ventricular hypertrophy are strongly associated with uh, sudden cardiac death in dialysis patients. So studies have uh, focused on um, understanding better the left ventricular hypertrophy, knowing what is the factors, the contributing factors that can lead to left ventricular hypertrophy, uh, um, um, uh, knowing that treating left ventricular hypertrophy um, are likely to improve the mortality and morbidity uh, uh, in dialysis patients. They found that actually hypervolemia may lead to uh, hypertension and eventually left ventricular hypertrophy. So um, uh, they have been assessing uh, um, the hypervolemia, the factors that can contribute to hypervolemia, uh, um, especially that hypervolemia is quite common in BD patients and it's associated with increased uh, mortality. Multiple, uh, um, multiple studies have been done before. Uh, multiple studies have been done before and, and showed that reduced hypervolemia by salt restriction um, has led to reduced left ventricular hypertrophy. Uh, multiple uh, measures and tools has been used to assess the volume status um, in dialysis patients. Um, and one of these actually is the bioelectrical impedance analysis uh, that has been uh, evaluated since 90s to uh, overcome the, the variation and the limitation that we have uh, um, using the clinical judgment. So uh, the bioelectrical impedance uh, analysis was used in this uh, fluid trial, and it's basically uh, they would measure the, the impedance uh, uh, to the flow of the electrical current in the body compartment um, through the, the assessment of the uh, reactance and resistance. Uh, so this is basically the first part of the trial, is the uh, um, hypervolemia assessment by BIA um, and its impact on um, uh, left ventricular mass. And the second part of the study is the vitamin D uh, supplements. So low vitamin D is quite common and is associated with uh, cardiovascular related uh, morbidity in dialysis patients. Uh, um, and uh, they would, uh, or assuming that left, uh, vitamin D deficiency can lead to hypertension and left ventricular hypertrophy through activation of uh, RAS mechanism. Uh, so the aim of this trial, again, this trial has two randomized comparisons in the participating BD patients. So the first comparison is the uh, BIA-guided BIA protocol to correct hypervolemia compared with the usual care. And the second comparison is vitamin D supplementation compared with placebo. And they would actually assess the impact of uh, these interventions on the left ventricular mass. The design of this trial, it was well, multi-center. 
It was multi-centered, uh, conducted in six centers on, in, uh, um, in Ontario, Canada, randomized, placebo-controlled, and participants were recruited from November 2011 uh, till August 2015. Uh, the participants were randomly allocated in a two-by-two two factorial design into four groups, uh, vitamin D versus placebo, BIA guided BD versus usual, uh, usual care to get four groups, BIA plus vitamin D, BIA plus placebo, usual care vi plus vitamin D, and usual care plus placebo. Uh, so they include in the trial part participant of 18 years of age and older uh, who were receiving uh, perineal dialysis as the sole form of um, renal replacement therapy. And they excluded from the trial uh, the participants who had contraindication to BIA or cardi cardiac magnetic resonance imaging, uh, life or technique expectancy less than one year, rec uh, recent peritonitis, non-icodextrin or colicalciferol intolerance, current ergocalciferol or uh, colicalciferol use, and hypercalcemia with a serum calcium uh, more than 2.55 uh, millimole per liter. So for the trial procedure, in the first randomized comparison, all participants underwent uh, CMR at baseline and at one year, and all participants underwent BIA evaluation at each clinic visit, um, um, mainly every two months. In the usual care group, um, the change in, changes in medication and dialysis prescription is basically made by the primary nef nephrologist based on the clinical assessment. Changes to treatment and goal weight were not recorded. For the BIA guided group, the participants were treated with the protocol to correct hypervolemia based on the current BIA result. Yeah. In the second randomized comparison, uh, so vitamin D group, they were receiving uh, 50,000 units of colicalciferol weekly for eight weeks, followed by 10,000 uh, units weekly for uh, 44 weeks. Um, and then the uh, placebo group receiving matching placebo. And they had uh, follow-up visits to assess adherence occurred at first month, second month, and then every two months. The use of non-study vitamin D and its analogs were recorded at each visit. This is the protocol that has been used for the um, assessment um, and management of hypervolemia and uh, um, and the BIA group, and there was two uh, protocols, separate protocols, one for CABD patients and one for ABD patients. Uh, so if the patient is hypervolemic based on the BIA evaluation, uh, uh, they have, the patient have to, um, uh, have to follow or, or multiple steps has been taken uh, to manage the hypervolemia, knowing that if the patients uh, developed hypotension with a systolic blood pressure less than 100, they would decrease or stop non-essential blood pressure medicine before the next step. So the first step, uh, if the patient is hypervolemic, they have to patient to meet with a uh, dietitian, reduce daily salt intake to less than 80 millimole, um, increase diuretics as needed, and there was a protocol they were following uh, to increase the diuretics and patients with the residual renal function. So the first um, the first step is to give uh, ferrosamide 80 to 120 milligram twice daily. If the patient is still hypervolemic, they would increase the dose to 120 milligram twice daily and add metaloz metalozone 55 uh, milligram daily. If the patient is still hypervolemic, they would increase as needed, knowing the maximum dose uh, was 180 milligram of uh, ferrosamide and 10 milligram of metalozone. If the patient still hypervolemic, despite these measures, they would move to step two, use uh, um, up to two liter external dwell in the longer dwell if not currently in use. Um, if the patient is already on, on uh, extraneal dwell, they would go to step three, which is increase glucose strength to, uh, um, uh, to 2.5% in three bags um, uh, per day. And if still the patient hypervolemic, they would add another uh, or second daytime extraneal well up to two liters. If the patient still hypervolemic, they would uh, consider additional steps, uh, which includes increase the glucose strength uh, to 2.5 in all of the bags, increase the dwell volume by 25% uh, as tolerated. And if the patient is high average or high transporters uh, and CABD, they would consider conver converging to um, ABD. In the ABD protocol, 
the steps um, are almost similar, except in step three, they would adjust the cycle timing and the frequency. The outcomes that has been assessed in this trial uh, was the primary outcome uh, is the change in the LV mass at one year measured by CMR. All patients underwent examination, whether the PIA or the CMR by the uh, same um, uh, scanner. And for the secondary outcome is the composite of death non-fatal cardiovascular event, uh, whether stroke, MI, amputation, congestive heart failure, or transfer to hemodialysis for dialysis inadequacy or ultrafiltration failure. Uh, renal and perineal urea clearance, 24-hour urine volume, BIA-derived volume measures, uh, change in bone mineral metabolism, laboratory parameters, and fractures. So the results of this study. Uh, this is the flowchart of this study. So 255 participants were assessed for eligibility. 182 of them were excluded because they basically were meeting the exclusion criteria. Uh, um, uh, so 73 participants underwent baseline CMR and eight of them were excluded mainly because of claustrophobia, uh, leaving 65 participants uh, for randomization. So they were randomized into four groups. Uh, 19 were assigned to BIA and vitamin D, 13 were assigned to BIA and placebo, 15 were assigned to usual care and vitamin D, and 18 were assigned to usual care and placebo. And they had uh, to follow up or, over a year, uh, according to the um, trial technique that we mentioned before. So during this year, one year follow up, uh, two of the patients received the transplant, three of them died, and seven of them withdrew, uh, withdrew from the trial. After they finished the, the first year of the follow-up, the patient would receive the, uh, would underwent uh, another CMR for comparison of the LV mass. But uh, this study actually, uh, they continued to follow up the patients um, after the uh, one year. Um, and during this uh, follow-up, they would assess for another clinical events that might be related to the, um, to the intervention. Um, and during and this, uh, the median follow-up uh, duration was around uh, two and a half to three years um, after the uh, beyond the one year. And during that time, uh, around 13 participants died. Uh, so this is the baseline characteristics of the included uh, participants. Um, uh, 65. Uh, overall of 65 participants were included, 32 in the BI, BIA group, 33 in the usual care group, 34 in vitamin D group, and 31 in the placebo group. Uh, um, all of the baseline character, or all of the groups basically were reasonably balanced, except that in the vitamin D group, there was basically a higher average uh, high transporter uh, uh, prevalence of 85%. So that was statistically significant compared with the placebo group of 55%. And there was also a higher incidence of uh, congestive heart failure par uh, participants in the usual care group of 21% versus zero in the BIA group. And same also for the hypertension. 100% of the participants in the usual care group were, uh, were hypertensive versus in the BIA group of 84%. Aside from this, um, this study actually is uh, um, uh, well representative for the female gender. Around half of the participants were female, 48%. But on the other side, it's more representative of the uh, Caucasian of the Caucasian participants, uh, with 75% uh, of the participants were Caucasian. Um, 74% uh, of the patients were on diuretics, knowing that their dialysis vintage was around 1.7 uh, years. Uh, so that's mean likely for like the BD patients, they would still have residual renal function. And then uh, the alpha calcidol or calcitriol, there was a 54% of the uh, participants uh, were using that at the time of enrollment. So uh, let's see what has happened during the one year in terms of the BIA guided therapy versus usual care. So this, this table represents the changes in the volume and adequacy associated, adequacy associated parameters um, in the participants. So uh, let's talk about the volume associated parameters. 
So the first thing is here is the total body water. So in the BIA, uh, they started with a baseline of 40.4 liters plus minus 7.7. .7. And then after a year, there was a decrease of um, 0 0.9 plus minus 2.4 liters uh, um, uh, down to 38 plus 38.9 uh, plus minus 7.3. Compared with the usual care, um, uh, they basically started with a higher baseline of 41.1 plus minus 8.7. And then uh, they increased actually the the uh, the total body water increased by 1.4 plus minus 3.4 um, um, com in, compar in comparison with the usual care group. The adjusted mean difference for baseline value was 2.4 uh, degrees uh, in favor of the BIA group. Um, but then assessment of the extracellular uh, fluid showed that uh, in the BIA group, there was a decrease by uh, 0 0.7 plus minus 1.7 um, in the BIA, BIA group compared with uh, a drop of 0 0.4 plus minus 5.7 um, in the usual care group. Uh, the ratio was not significantly different in between both groups. And then looking to the hypervolemia, um, it's around half of the patients in the BIA group were hypervolemic at, uh, um, at baseline around 44%. And in the usual care group, there was uh, more hypervolemic patients, 61% of the patients. And now looking to the adequacy associated parameters in the participants, the weekly renal, perineal, and total KT over, over V um, has not significantly changed in, in both groups. Uh, but if we look to the urine output, the, in the BIA group, uh, the, the participants uh, has a baseline of 1,057 plus minus 513 ml of urine output. That was uh, uh, decreased by 424 plus minus 602 in the BIA group. And this decrease was higher in comparison with the usual care group where they uh, had a baseline of 956 plus minus 597. Uh, that was um, uh, decreased by uh, 235 plus minus 806 uh, ml. And the uh, D over P creatinine has not significantly changed between both groups. The proportion of BIA group participants who made the corresponding number of steps in the volume management algorithm. Uh, so at the end of, uh, of the uh, first year, at 12 months, there was around 50% of the participants who uh, did not had any steps, um, um, who did not make any steps in the volume management algorithm. And then um, around the 20, uh, 15 to 20% had just one step and the rest had um, um, up to five steps. And the reason for non-adherence was um, hypotension, participant refusal, hospitalization, and use of non-protocolized intervention based on clinical circumstances. Uh, so the outcomes of this trial has been uh, classified according, or according to BIA intervention and according to vitamin D intervention. Um, so reviewing the primary outcome according to the BIA intervention, so basically there was no significant difference in the LV mass uh, in the BIA group compared with the usual uh, care group. And so the left ventricular mass in the BAI group, um, BIA group at baseline was 141.2 uh, plus minus 44.2. There was a, a change, uh, there was an increase actually by 1.3 plus minus 14.3. Compared with the usual care group, they started with a higher um, LV mass uh, at baseline, 145.8 plus minus 57. And, the, um, and by the end of the year, uh, there was a decrease by 2.4 plus minus 37. Um, and then uh, same for the left ventricular uh, mass index. Um, uh, there was a change by uh, 0 0.9 plus minus 8.6 in the uh, BIA group um, increase, and there was a decrease in the usual group by 2.4 uh, plus minus 20.5. Um, if you look at these numbers in the LV mass, there is um, a high variance actually in the, in the baseline numbers and even um, after a one-year follow-up. 
But despite this difference between the usual care and the BIA group and the results, it was not statistically significant. And one important thing to mention here, that left ventricular uh, mass index, uh, this is the normal values. So based on the baseline numbers, it's mainly uh, uh, significant or high numbers uh, for females, not for males. The left ventricular and diastolic volume and systolic volume and stroke volume um, and uh, uh, ejection fraction has not, uh, has not significantly uh, changed uh, um, in comparison between both groups. And uh, this is the subgroup analysis for the primary outcome, uh, comparing BIA versus usual group adjusted for baseline uh, values and congestive heart failure, anuric versus non-anuric, ABD versus CABD, high um, high average transporter versus low low average transporter and uh, post hoc analysis of uh, volume expanded versus non volume expanded there was no uh, significant interaction between the groups and now moving to the changes based on the vitamin d supplementation so this table represents the changes in uh, bone mineral uh, metabolism value in participants who were receiving vitamin d or placebo uh, so again, in vitamin D, there was a 34 participants compared with the placebo, there was a 31 uh, participants. Um, and basically, uh, serum, serum calcium and phosphorus, uh, serum calcium phosphate, albumin and BTH um, um, has not significantly changed in between uh, both groups. And this is on the sides um, uh, just for conversion uh, of the units. Uh, for the serum vitamin D, uh, 25 hydroxy vitamin D and the uh, vitamin D group, they started with a baseline 51.6 plus minus 29. And there was a change of uh, by 17.2 uh, plus minus 30.8 uh, compared with the uh, placebo group. They started with 48 plus minus 21. And there was a decrease by 8.2 plus minus 20.4. And this result uh, was statistically significant. Um, and they also assessed the 25 hydroxy vitamin D replete. Uh, so at baseline, there was a 13 uh, replete uh, participants in vitamin D group, and there was a change by 11. Um, uh, so basically, there was at the end of the uh, first year or the at the end of the 12 months, there was a 22 um, uh, uh, vitamin D replete participants. Compared with the placebo, uh, they started with nine, and there, there was a change um, of one. By the end of, uh, there was a change. Uh, there was a, a two uh, by the end of uh, one year, and then for the alpha calcidol and ca uh, calcitriol dose. So in vitamin D patient, there was a decrease of the dose by uh, zero point two eight plus minus zero point four one in the vitamin D group, compared with um, an increase in the dose in uh, the placebo group by zero point twelve plus minus uh, zero point forty two. And this result uh, was statistically significant. So the primary outcomes according to vitamin D intervention, and again, there was no uh, significant uh, uh, change in the LD mass uh, um, between both groups. And uh, this, this uh, table actually represents that these in numbers. So in, in um, vitamin D group, there was a decrease by three plus minus 28 um, um, by LV mass um, at the end of the, um, or during that one year. And then the placebo group, there was a, an increase by two plus minus 31 in the LV mass. Um, the, the other parameters, there was no significant uh, um, difference in between both the groups. And the subgroup analysis for the primary outcome between vitamin D and placebo group adjusted for baseline value and congestive heart failure um, um, is basically for the same uh, groups. Um, it showed uh, there was no significant inter interaction. And the post hoc analysis for vitamin D uh, less than 50 and uh, uh, 50 and more, there also was no significant difference or interaction. So this table basically represents the summary of the primary outcome, uh, which is the change in LV mass according to the combined BIA versus usual group and vitamin D versus placebo. 
So in BIA and vitamin D group, there was a decrease uh, of LV mass by 1.1 plus minus 8.8 .8 by the end of the first year. And in usual care um, and vitamin D group, there was a decrease by 5 plus minus 40. And in BIA group and placebo, there was an increase by 5.3 plus minus 20. In usual care and placebo, there was a change of 0 plus minus 36 uh, in the LV mass. And again, these results were not statistically significant. For the secondary outcome, um, for the secondary outcome, so basically there was um, no statistical significant difference uh, in between the groups except for the, um, uh, the death in the vitamin D group versus placebo, there was a higher uh, uh, mortality in the placebo group when, it's, when it was compared with the vitamin D group uh, by 39% uh, in placebo group versus 12% in vitamin D group. And also there was um, um, a higher transfer to hemodialysis in patients who was in vitamin D group uh, compared with a placebo group uh, by 15%. Otherwise, the composite of death cardiovascular events and transfer to uh, hemodialysis, um, um, number of hospitalization, and even fracture was not significantly different between both the groups, between the four groups. Um, again, the mortality in the BIA group versus usual group was not statistically significant. Uh, but if we look to the vitamin D group and placebo, um, uh, the mortality was actually, uh, or the curve started earlier in the placebo group in, compar in comparison with the vitamin D group. Uh, the incidence of additional adverse events uh, on the four groups. Uh, so in the BIA versus usual group, any adverse event, uh, vasovagal episodes, cardiac ischemia, infarction, uh, hypotension or electrolyte abnormality was not uh, uh, significantly different between both groups. And for vitamin D and placebo, any adverse events, cardiac ischemia or infarction, cardiac arrhythmias or hypercalcemia uh, were not actually significant in between both groups. Uh, so the limitation of this uh, trial that the allocation order might not be perfectly random and the changes in LV mass is a surrogate endpoint, but it's not a substitute for clinically important outcomes. Uh, given the LV, uh, the high LV mass variance, the study uh, was underpowered to detect a clinically significant change in the left ventricular mass. And as we as we uh, uh, saw before, only about half of the participants on BD had evidence of hypervolemia with a dialysis vintage of less than two years. So longer term BIA intervention where more participants would uh, become hypervolemic is needed. A limitation in the ability to differentiate a true reduction in volume from a loss of lean body mass or lean muscle mass using BIA. And this is one of the known limitation for using a BIA. The increase of uh, 25 hydroxyvitamin D levels was uh, seen in this, uh, was less robust uh, than in the previous um, published studies. So the conclusion of this study, um, a protocol that utilized BIA-derived measures of hypervolemia had a modest impact on volume status with no impact on CMR-determined uh, LV mass. Routine incorporation of BIA to guide fluid management in, deep, in BD patients based on this uh, study result cannot be recommended based on the trial finding. And vitamin D supplementation um, increased 25 hydroxyvitamin D levels and reduced active vitamin D dosing, but did not impact the LD mass as uh, shown in other uh, studies. The observed reduction in mortality and vitamin D observed um, in this trial, taken in conjunction with the findings of the previous studies, uh, informs the need for a large clinical trial to determine if inactive vitamin D supplementation improves the clinically important outcomes in dialysis patients. And that's the end of the presentation. Any questions or comment? That was a great uh, job, Farah. Yeah. And I think we'll just, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, go ahead, Jen. Oh, no, go ahead. I was going to see if 
anybody wanted to start off. Um, so um, I'll kick off the discussion. I just wanted to read off some um, comments in the chat. So this is actually something I was interested in as well. Um, looking at the differences in terms of the residual kidney function and also the urine output, because that is something um, that I always kind of keep an eye on is when I try to intensify the prescription to take care of the hypervolemia, I always worry that the urine output is going to drop off. I've never had it drop off completely, which because I feel like if I have the urine output cut, cut off completely, then I'm probably drying out the patient. Um, but sometimes it is alarming, especially to the patients when they say, I'm just not urinating as much. Um, but uh, Matt was Matt Rivara, um, who is the co-host of this uh, journal club, wanted to make a point in table two that it looks like there's no difference in the change in the weekly renal KT over V between the two groups. And that's kind of reassuring because some people had had some concerns about BIA targeted volume management and residual kidney function. Um, CJHN did note that the urine output did drop off more, um, but as um, Dr. Matthew pointed out, the numeric decrease in urine output was not significant. So even though the urine output in the BIA group went from 1,000 uh, milliliter to 633, so a drop of about 400 uh, cc's, um, and for the usual care group, they went from, again, about a liter 956 down to 721, so that was a drop of only 235 cc's. Um, that difference wasn't statistically significant. Um, so I don't know if anybody else had anything else to add about that. I would say it is good to see that um, the actual numeric numbers also, the drop in the weekly KT review in the two groups were the same. It was um, 0.3. So it's nice to know that even though there's a bigger drop numerically, again, in the urine output, um, the clearance, uh, the difference in the clearance was still about the same, um, which I think, uh, again, was, was reassuring. Um, ben, uh, ben Lidgard was asking if, given that we know that there are differences in the left ventricular um, mass um, between the two sexes, you know, with the caveat that there were some low ends here where their results stratified by sex for the left ventricular mass outcome. Um, and Dr. Bimble noted that it wasn't pre-specified. Um, in retrospect, probably would have been a good idea, but again, there are some small numbers um, that were at play there. And I'll go ahead and open up the floor for any other questions. Yeah, this is, uh, this is Matt, Jenny, thanks. Um, I'm curious if, you know, Dr. Brimble can can comment on, you know, some of the things that I think you wrote, wrote about in your discussion, but, um, you know, some interesting things came out. So one is that the left ventricular mass seemed to be sort of relatively low, even after the one-year period compared to other descriptions of LV mass in at least in HD patients as one sort of challenge with the, uh, the study. And then the other study the other issue that I think you raised was in the BIA group, just not that many people actually had interventions made uh, based on their BIA measurements, implying that people's fluid status was reasonably well controlled already. So the question is, is that something just in this population because your patients are exquisitely well managed at baseline uh, in terms of their volume status, or uh, is this something about PD patients in general? I'm just curious what your thoughts are. Sure. No, it's a great question, and it caused these issues caused us a lot of angst uh, through the trial. Um, so, just a few comments. So, uh, the cardiologist who was reading the MRIs kind of came to me one day and said, "You know, these patients they don't really look very hypertensive. He didn't obviously uh, break the seal or anything. He didn't know who was randomized to what, but just generally at baseline, he was kind of making that that uh, observation." He also was a bit skeptical at the uh, literature's report of um, intra-individual variation or variability of the measure. So at the end of the day, we were underpowered. Um, yeah, and, and again, in retrospect, we probably, when determining sample size, should have had a bit more foresight to consider that not every patient would be subjected to the BIA intervention, and that would limit our sample size, but it was difficult to know 
to what extent to adjust. I think at least part of the explanation also is, you know, we certainly wanted to recruit patients with longer PD vintage, um, but recruitment was was slow. We had to keep adding sites and continue to struggle. Uh, so we did have to start looking to patients who were newer to PD and eventually, you know, essentially incident patients. So I think, you know, if you could enrich the patient population for uh, those with uh, lower residual renal function, you're more likely to have patients who are hypervolemic at baseline. Um, but uh, again, at some point, uh, it was a very long trial, considering the number of patients. We did have more patients than years it took to do the study, but uh, it felt about as long as uh, sometimes. I'm wondering if you can comment, uh, Dr. Brimble, on the, just the process, the logistics of actually doing BIA in someone and then kind of making the changes to their plan, their PD prescription to address the volume. I mean, is that something that, you know, once you get facile at it is sort of reasonable to do in clinical practice? Is this still a research tool? I mean, what are, you, what are your thoughts? Yeah, and of course, there, there are different ways to output a result to decide whether you're going to you know, make some decisions. So we were using what's sort of been called the Piccoli graph, which, you know, requires the data to be inputted into Excel spreadsheets. And that does take a little bit of time. So in in reality, when we were doing this, the decisions were made after the visit. So, you know, you would get the output and um, and then we would tend to show, we like to show the patients when they would come back, you know, the output and try to get them to be incentivized to make some changes if they could. Um, you know, I think very telling is we don't do this in the clinic now. So uh, we, we found it not difficult to do. It takes five minutes to do it. We've all done it on ourselves at various points uh, during the trial for fun. So it doesn't take much time at all, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, I don't think we found that the results were super helpful and the, the trial kind of showed that again for patients who are on dialysis for longer periods of time you know maybe maybe there's a role for it but uh, it's not something I use clinically so I mean it seems like um, based on the conclusions that you had in the paper you know, your feeling currently is that, you know, BIA measurements of hydration status certainly are predictive of outcomes in dialysis patients, but that that second step of sort of using that to guide volume management, mm -hmm. you know, this along with the other studies, at least in PD patients, there just doesn't seem to be the evidence base to support this uh, sort of use in clinical practice. Is that a fair, fair assessment? Yeah, I think so. I mean, you know, again, if you look, I, I think there is probably enough data to to suggest that you can reduce fluid volume in patients with BIA. But I mean, you could probably just, your intervention could just simply be, you know, taking the clinical approach, you're going to be aggressive about it. You know, if you randomize patients to to think about volume and and, and aggressively manage with an algorithm, because you know, this isn't just a BI intervention. It's also an algorithmic approach to uh, getting volume down intervention. So it's hard to separate those. Uh, so we, we we have done a meta-analysis of BI and PD that's not out yet, but uh, I do believe it was positive for, for a volume reduction, depending on how you measure it. But yeah, we don't use it. The other thing I just might add, and, and uh, uh, Dr. Avazan, did indicate this, but you know you can see there's uh, even on the on the table three there there's significant drop off in patients who um, did not do the one year MRI who were excluded they had higher LV mass substantially more so it was hard to get patients who were probably already pretty sick you know longer vintage to get through a one year trial um, so. Again, that's a, definitely a limitation of the trial um, that we lost a significant number of patients to the one-year MRI, they, and they were, for whatever reason, tended to have substantially higher LV masses. Mm 
I mean, clearly the, you know, the volume management is, is probably one of the most important things that we do for our dialysis patients. And so I think that the, the effort here was warranted and I think it's, it's really telling, you know, there's it, obviously BIA is not our only measure of volume or, or a uh, technical measure of volume. Um, and so the question is, can we improve upon clinical assessment and, you know, using ultrasound and maybe additional agents. And so, you know, I think that this is at least informative and able to tell us that, you know, we need to look a little bit further because right now what it's saying is that we are still pretty good at assessing volume status, or at least seemingly so um, clinically. Um, and we just haven't found that extra um, extra technology that can sort of enhance upon um, clinical assessment. So, you know, some of the newer agents will be interesting to see. Yeah, and I, I don't know what, you know, utilization of uh, icodextrin is, you know, in the U.S., but, you know, I think with the tools we have, I, I might push back a little bit on 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 how important volume is in these patients. You know, I used to, I've been around long enough to know, go through the years of it's all about adequacy, it's all about adequacy, and, and then we decided it wasn't so important anymore. And then we, we certainly have switched gears to volume and after doing this trial, I'm, I'm, I'm not as convinced anymore, um, but certainly there is a group of patients where it is important and maybe clinically um, we're not as good at detecting it. All our fellows now are carrying ultrasound machines with them and and uh, incorporating into the routine assessment. It's a tool for that, but uh, yeah, it is interesting. Uh, this is Jenny Shen. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I don't know what the prescription patterns are like in Canada. I know for, uh, you know, multiple people who have told me that in um, Europe, they have these high dose uh, diuretic pills. And here we're basically very conservative. So I usually go up to Frosmide 120 twice a day and Metolazone 10 twice a day. And I saw that the max that um, the protocol indicated was to go up to Frosmide of 120. Uh, twice a day with the addition of metolazone. So, um, and I was just kind of getting an idea of, of the other um, uh, audience members, kind of what they're using. And Dr. Lidgard, uh, who's up at UW, said that they're using actually a lot more torsamide rather than the ferosamide because of the longer half-life up to 100 uh, BID in some patients. So I didn't know um, if Canada is similar to the U.S. in that there's a uh, how aggressive you are in terms of um, in usual practice. I know that this was the protocol for what you consider to be usual care, but if there is any um, pushback or surprise from the nephrologist in this um, study in terms of the doses of diuretics used. Yeah, no, I don't think so. I, there was one site who wondered why we hadn't, they joined a little bit later and they wondered why we hadn't included spironolactone because they had used that quite a bit. Um, so again, we might have thought about using that one as a, an adjunctive therapy. Um, but no, I don't think there was much pushback. Um, from Twitter, I see Torsamide mentioned a lot. It's not available in Ontario. Uh, the only alternative that I'm aware of is bumetanide, but it it's only available as sort of compassionate release. So uh, we're kind of stuck with just furosemide here. Do you think that... Um... Some of the advantage of vitamin D, at least in PD patients, is the residual kidney function as compared to HD patients. Advantage as in? What, I mean, so if there is one, like a mortality or even reducing uh, active vitamin D use. I, I mean, my personal feeling is this was a spurious finding and it's, 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 it would not be replicated in, in other trials. And certainly there's isn't evidence in other patient populations pretty broad, broadly studied. So, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, there's certainly data on PD patients being different in terms of uh, vitamin D deficiency. Why that is, I don't really know, but, you know, and we certainly at least proved we could get the vitamin D levels up. And I was intrigued by the reduction in active vitamin D. And I think maybe that's, that's, Maybe that's advantageous. Um, if, if we think, uh, you know, vascular calcification, if we're, you know, in, if we are 
making that a bigger problem than it would otherwise be. But uh, again, the numbers are small and, and I'm really skeptical of the results, but we had to present them as they, as they presented themselves. Actually, use of active vitamin D may be potentially beneficial. Yep, it's a possibility. I'd like to see it replicated. Has yeah. this... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Thanks. Uh, I certainly think the vitamin D findings are intriguing. Um, definitely kind of flies in the face of what we might see in the larger randomized trials in the general population. Um, and even some of the findings in the CKD population as well, not necessarily showing CV benefit for vitamin D. Um, but yeah, I'd it, be intrigued to see what any larger trials might show. Just because we have so few agents that actually improve cardiovascular mortality in dialysis patients. Yeah, and to be honest, the vitamin D was an afterthought. We had gotten funding for the BIA intervention and um, the, the group, the research group that helped us to run the clinical trial, PHRI, they've done, you know, hope on target, transcend all the, all the big cardiovascular trials. And they said, you should do a factorial design, come up with something cheap. And vitamin D was popular at the time, so we just added it very last minute. Maybe this will rekindle some of the popularity. I'm not sure. We'll see. And then, Dr. Brimble, has this changed your clinical practice at all or how you teach? Nope. <laughs> nope. Almost a decade of my life. <laughs> Dr. Brimble, do you have um, some sort of insights into? Because the other thing that was intriguing, just in terms of clinical trial design, uh, or maybe more um, worrisome, is despite a simple design, you had trouble recruiting patients. I mean, do you want to maybe comment on that? At least it's, I think that's important for some of the fellows and even for us to know just for our future design of, or future planning for trials. Sure. Yeah, this, I mean, this was my second RCT. The first one was in the hemodialysis units and anemia management algorithm. And that I was actually a fellow when I started that one. And, and I thought it was the easiest thing to do in the world. And why don't we all do these all the time? And um, so, you know, again, big difference between a captive population and a hemodialysis unit, you know, shorter duration, um, pretty, pretty easy to conduct. Um, and then moving to PD and outpatient therapy. Um, and the cardiac MRI was a big obstacle. So, you know, again, even though these patients aren't in a dialysis center, they, they still seem how somehow managed to talk to each other. And the uh, word got around that doing a cardiac MRI isn't necessarily the funnest thing in the world to do. So we had attrition, even those who went in, we had significant attrition that we didn't even randomize. And we at least had enough foresight to um, sort of basically you had to be able to do the first M cardiac MRI to be randomized. So we did at least think of that. So yeah, it's it's there were a lot of obstacles. I'm not sure how simple a trial it was. And at the end of the day, the, the intervention was at least on the BIA side was quite complex. The vitamin D easy was definitely a straightforward one. But the cardiac MRI was a pretty significant disincentive for patients. Um, some centers didn't see their patients as often as we had assumed they would. So asking patients at some of the other centers to come back to the clinic more often than they otherwise would was another disincentive. So yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, doing randomized trials is, is not easy for the most part. Um, but it is the highest quality of evidence that we have. So I do encourage the fellows to consider getting involved, um, you know, at, at the ground level with these trials. But uh, if I learned anything, it's make it as simple as you can. Um, don't complicate things. Don't add endless, you know, like for those of you who've done trials, these things called CRFs or case report forms. I mean, I think our, our document was, there's probably about 80 or 90 case report forms by the end. You know, again, for a trial with less than 70 patients, in retrospect, it was much too complicated. So looking back, if you had to do it over again, 
would you change your primary outcome or would you, because it was so hard to get the MRIs or do you feel like, I guess um, that's the level of like a, a change in LV mass is the level of evidence the community is looking for? Yeah, I know it's a, it's a great question. I mean, I think we were, we definitely did not want to do echo determined LV mass. We knew how sort of susceptible to volume the measurement was. So I thought that was going to be very problematic to do. Certainly, we were never going to be able to come up with a sample size in a PD population to look at a clinically important sort of MACE outcome. Um, so we were kind of stuck in the middle where cardiac MRI was probably the best surrogate we could use. Um, so, yeah, I, I don't know if I would have done it differently. I think it was still important to do. I think I would have just to get in retrospect, just try to come up with a way to to make it uh, less less complex an intervention and collecting fewer things to reduce burden on patients in terms of visits. And um, but other than that, I know I think I would have I would do it again just with with the wisdom of doing the trial. Um, to do a few tweaks. And what do you think the next step should be, whether it's you or somebody else in terms of, you know, moving the field forward in terms of management of hypervolemia? Or do you think maybe that's, I guess, alluding to what you're saying, or do you think maybe we shouldn't be focusing as much on, on volume right now? Is there some other more important outcome we should be looking yeah. at? You know, I think a, a reasonable sort of, more of a observational study would just be yeah, just to get a better understanding using sort of multimodal you know approaches with our current sort of tools and in, in prescribing PD you know just let's get a better sense of how big a problem you know hypervolemia is in this patient population. We were relying mostly on older literature um, with less up. To, I, I just I can say in my career just. Being able to use ipodextrin has been a big game changer in terms of managing volume status. That the volume, you know, I just did PD clinic uh, this morning, and uh, none of the patients, at least overtly, had issues with volume overload. They weren't hypertensive. You know, I was dealing with things like insomnia and, and knee pain and, and all the other things that our patients get, but not a lot of issues. So I think just getting a better understanding of how big a volume, big a problem volume is in these patients. Um, a longitudinal study to really kind of understand at what point during the PD journey volume maybe become more important because there's no question as residual kidney function declines, it gets problematic. And having a better understanding of when we probably have to, you know, bail out on PD and, and switch therapies. Um, I'm again not sure what your transplant wait times are, but uh, locally it's sort of five to six years. So many of our patients will not go from PD to transplant, but will have to transition to hemo or some type of combination therapy. So understanding that a little bit better, I think, would be a worthwhile endeavor. Roy, go ahead. Did you have a question? Yeah, yeah just uh, actually, just quickly, I almost forgot to ask this. And, and I don't know how much to make of this, especially since a lot of the changes were sort of equivocal. You know, the blood pressure did go up in the BIA group and the diastolic significantly. So one of the questions, I mean, I, I'm not really sure how to explain that other than do you think that maybe some of the uh, was due to lowering of medications in the BIA group in response to hypotension, and maybe some of the LV changes were mitigated by stopping ACE inhibitors. Do you think any of those could have contributed? Yeah, I definitely think that's, that's possible, right? I think that's a possibility. I mean, there, there wasn't, it wasn't stipulated that they had to lower the blood pressure pills or doses unless hypotensive, but, you know, there was a lot of sort of discretion at the hands of the person making the prescription changes. They may have anticipated a problem um, with the intervention and, and made a co you know, coexisting reduction. So it's certainly a possibility that certainly could have mitigated things. All right, well, I think uh, 
if no one has any final questions, we can probably end a couple minutes early. Um, wanted to thank uh, Dr. Abu Azam for presenting and Dr. Brimble for being here and everyone for their comments and discussion. I remain optimistic we can find ways to help PD patients, but this uh, BIA certainly seems to follow on the heels of lung ultrasound and blood volume monitoring as ways that may not uh, work to help dialysis patients. So anyway, um, thanks everyone. And then Jenny, do you have the date off the top of your head for the next um, journal club? No, I know it'd be in two months on the second Monday. <laughs> okay. We'll make sure we email everyone out uh, with the next date. And oh, hope it'll be March 13th. March 13th. Okay, excellent. Well, thanks everyone and have a great rest of your week. Thanks everyone. Thank you.